Let's take our Bibles and turn to Jonah chapter 3. It's been a while since we've been in Jonah, but we're going to restart our uh, series, and we're going to run with it to a completion. Uh, It's a series I've entitled Man on the Run, because this is the story of a prophet who was reluctant to fulfill God's calling in his life. And God indeed has to change his heart, which he does, and then God uses him to change a city. And that's where we're at in Jonah chapter 3. We covered verses uh, 1 through 4 the last time. I want to come back and look at them briefly and work into the rest of the chapter. A message I've called the Great Awakening. Because in this chapter, we're going to see Nineveh repents. It's an astounding thing. So let's stand and honor of God's Word. Follow along as we go back into verse 1 and then continue on from verse 5 to the end of the chapter. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell? if God will turn and relent and turn away from His fierce anger so that we may not perish. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from that disaster that He sent, or that He said He would bring upon them, and He did not do it. So reads God's Word. You may be seated. I love the story of John Getty, Canadian missionary from a Scottish Presbyterian family, felt called of God and burdened by God to go to the New Hebrides Islands in the South Seas. This was a part of the world where sin reigned. The islands were marked by um, violence and theft and warfare among the tribes, and there was even pockets of cannibalism. So this was no small task to go to the New Hebrides and bring the gospel. But John Getty went, and God used him in a wonderful way. In 1849, he writes in his diary in the the month of February, in the darkness, degradation, pollution, and misery that surrounds me, I look forward in faith to the time when some of these poor islanders will unite in the triumphant song of ransomed souls." He had a vision. He had a burden. He had an anticipation that God might use him in a wonderful way, and God did, and the gospel spread, and lives were changed. So much so that when he leaves the island later in life, the islanders erect a memorial to him in the island church. It says this, in the memory of John Getty, when he landed in 1948, there were no Christians here. When he left in 1872, there were no heathen. Wow. That's a great story. You should read something of his life. And the story of John Getty and his work on the New Hebrides Islands in the South Sea is a story of God's sweeping work where he upends a culture, where he transforms a people from top to bottom. Because you see, at times in history, God has so moved and has worked in such a fashion 
that people have come to faith in their thousands, suddenly, sovereignly, savingly, swept up into God's kingdom. Places and cultures have been changed beyond recognition through the gospel. When he got here, there were no Christians. When, when he left, there were no heathen. <laughs> Love that. And that's just one story of many stories that punctuate church history. Stories of spiritual awakenings, or to borrow the words of Acts 3 verse 19, times of refreshing that come from the presence of God. In fact, our country here has known times like that. You go back to colonial America in the early, 19, uh, in the early 1700s, God used Jonathan Edwards and the preaching of George Whitfield to sweep up hundreds and thousands of people into the kingdom. There were spiritual reverberations felt throughout the nation in its early days. It was said uh, of New England that 90% of the population had heard George Whitfield preach. And it wasn't business as usual in New England in those days. In fact, in the history of my own native country of Northern Ireland, God moved in 1859 in what was known as the Ulster Revival. Started in a school with a little boy con convicted about his sin, so disturbed that he was dismissed by the teacher to go home. In fact, she sent a young boy with him to take him home, and, and the young boy that was to take him home was a Christian himself, and on the way home, he led that young boy to faith in Jesus Christ. The crowds lifted, and, and, and the sunshine of God's love radiated through that child's life. He immediately returned to the schoolroom, told the teacher that he was now happy and at peace with God. And you know what? One child after another child began to fall like pins in receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and that began to spread out uh, like ripples across a lake. And Northern Ireland was shaken by our, our, an awakening that brought thousands of people to faith. In fact, um, in the 1920s, another awakening took place centered on the preaching of W.P. Nicholson, an Irish evangelist. It was rather rough and gruff. God saved them out of, out of, out of a life of profligacy. And God used them as an instrument in His preaching, awakened the church and rocked the towns in which he preached. In fact, in Belfast, pubs closed and churches filled up. There were so many people saved and the change was so radical that the great shipbuilding company Harlan and Wolf had to build an extra warehouse to house all the stolen stuff that the guys were bringing back. In fact, they brought so much stuff back, they told them to keep the stuff they had stolen. And there are stories like that. When God awakes, when God saves sovereignly and suddenly, and you know what? We can't dial those times up. There's, there's no formula that makes them happen, but they do happen. And they happen serendipitously, and they happen sovereignly, and they happen surprisingly when God moves in, in great love and mercy. I, I don't think you can create a revival any more than you can control the wind, because the regenerating and refreshing work of the Holy Spirit is likened to a wind in John 3 verse 8. And Jesus said, the wind blows where it wishes. Uh, you and I can't create a revival no more than we can control the wind, although I would say this, we can maybe set our seals to catch that wind when it begins to blow. We can't presume upon great awakenings, but we can pray for them. We can, we can, we can prepare ourselves in a manner 
that allows indeed the wind of God's Spirit to, to blow with greater force in our midst. When I was growing up in Northern Ireland, we used to sing a, a hymn about showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. The whole point of that hymn was to remind us, hey, in the normal workings of the church, we enjoy the mercy drops of a soul here and a soul there. But, 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 but what about the showers? What, what about perhaps an ingathering of souls and an awakening in a nation? It has happened, and perhaps it is still to happen. And the idea of God on the move in, in a special manner is the door into the text here in jo Jonah chapter 3, because in Jonah chapter 3, we have what I call the Great Awakening. One of the greatest awakenings in the Bible. I mean, we could talk about the ministry of John the Baptist and how he prepared the way of the Lord and how as he preached, people came to the, to, to the, the River Jordan to be baptized in the baptism of repentance. There was a move of God. There was a stirring as in Israel. We could go to the day of Pentecost when Peter stands up and 3,000 souls are saved. But, but there is no greater awakening in all of the Bible than Jonah chapter 3. Because this is a city wholesale that repents of their sin. From the greatest to the least. From, from the palace to the projects. There's a spiritual awakening in Nineveh. In fact, if you remember in our opening study, we calculated from chapter 4 and verse 11, where we're told that there are 120,000 persons who cannot discern between right, their right hand and their left hand, which we believe is kind of a metaphorical language for children who are undiscerning. And we calculated if there are 120,000 children who haven't yet come to an age of understanding in this city, we could probably project that out to about 600,000 people once you add in mom and dad and some siblings. Now, that's the case. Or anything like that's the case. We're reading about a spiritual awakening that, that Im impacts and embraces 600,000 people. And so, we would do well to take a good look at this passage and be encouraged by what God does. Now, this isn't my outline, but we're going to see this morning and Next Sunday morning, as we look at verses um, uh, 5 through 10 especially, why God did it, where He did it, and who He did it through. I say, this isn't my outline, but we're going to see as we unpack and exposit this passage why God did it, because it's His nature to be merciful. Where did He do it? He did it in a wicked, pagan city. Who did he do it through? A broken and reluctant prophet. And I think all of those things are encouraging. It's the nature of God to save. It's the nature of God to be merciful, to be gracious. That gives me hope. God saves a city that's entrenched in wickedness, a culture marked by paganism, idolatry, and godlessness. That gives me hope. And the instrument God uses, well, that gives us all hope. So let's come and look at this passage. Now, we're going to look at several things. Only going to cover two this morning and maybe not even cover them. But we're going to work through the text. We're going to look at the man, the method, the message, the morning, the mercy, the miracle. But first of all, the man. In fact, we're going to back up into the verses we covered the last time, but kind of look at them from a different angle. I want us to consider the man, first of all. As we look at the great awakening, I want us to center our attention, first of all, on the man, the instrument that God uses. Because it's so important that we connect chapter 3 with chapter 2. There, there is an order here. There is a linkage that you don't want to miss. In chapter 3, we're going to see the reconciliation of the city of Nineveh to God. We're going to see God sweep a whole population of people into His kingdom. This is unprecedented, unparalleled. But before we see the reconciliation of a city to God, 
we are brought to see the reconciliation of a prophet to God. And that reconciliation precedes the other reconciliation. And I think the order and the linkage is important. In terms of the story, when we get to chapter 3, nothing has changed in terms of God's commission. You, you can read verses 1 two and 2, and, and you'll see that it's an echo of chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2. Nothing has changed in terms of the commission and what God wants to do. But I'll tell you what has changed. Jonah has changed. And he now is a, a catalyst for God's work. The mission hasn't changed, the message hasn't changed, but the man has been changed by all that he went through, by being kicked overboard on the boat. He was sinking in the water, swallowed by the fish. God did something in the life of his prophet. Then he spit out on the dry land. He kind of brushes the gunk and vomit off him, turns his face towards Nineveh, moves in that direction. And as he moves in that direction, God's about to move the man. God's got now a willing pair of hands to work with. I don't want, I don't want us to, to miss that. Jonah repents of his indifference. Jonah repents of his prejudice, his bias. You see, the greatest obstacle to conversion of Nineveh was not found in Nineveh. It was found in the prophet of God. Things were stalled because the man wouldn't go and preach the message and fulfill the mission. The problem's not in Nineveh, it's in Joppa. It's not with the people of Nineveh, it's with the prophet of God. It was not the sin and corruption of the Ninevites, although that was great. It wasn't their false cults. It wasn't their corrupt politicians. The biggest obstacle to the salvation of Nineveh was found in the heart of this pious, prejudiced man. And God had to break him, bring him to a place of submission uh, so that indeed he would fulfill the Great Commission. And I just think that's worth noting. When God starts to move with sweeping and saving power, he begins with his servant. Doesn't Peter say that, you know what, judgment needs to begin at the house of God? First Peter 4, verse 17. Isn't it interesting in Revelation 2 to 3 that before Jesus calls the world to repentance in the face of unfolding judgment, he calls the church to repentance five times in those seven letters, you'll find the word repent. God's work always begins in the house of God and moves out towards the world. Because a worldly church, a disobedient church, a carnal congregation cannot reach the world for Christ and cannot be a means of indeed an awakening should God deem that for that generation. I love the story. It's been well used by preachers on this subject concerning Gypsy Smith. Gypsy Smith was an evangelist of a bygone era used by God, a catalyst to bring about a reviving in the church and an awakening in the culture in the UK. And when he was once asked something of the secret of his success, he said to the pastor that asked him, and the pastor desired to see a move of God, an awakening in his own community. Here's what he said, brother, go home, lock yourself in your room, take a piece of chalk, draw a circle on the floor, then get down on your knees inside that circle Confess all known sin, determine to follow Jesus Christ, whatever the cost, whatever the call, ask Him to begin that work in you, and when this prayer is answered, you will have the beginning of a revival in your church. And I think we see that. Where where does revival begin? Where does an awakening begin if God in His sovereignty desires that to happen? It begins with you, and it begins with me begins with the church, not the society. May God enable us to draw a circle around our lives and spend some time asking ourselves, are we at that place where we can become a conduit for God's work? 
Are we vessels fit for the master's use? Are we setting our seal to catch the wind of the Spirit of God should He sovereignly and savingly move in a magnificent manner? He has, He yet might. The mercy drops are falling, but wouldn't it be nice to enjoy some showers of blessing sent from the Father above? In fact, let's look at this a little bit more for a few moments. As we look at the man and realize that the reconciliation of the city begins with the reconciliation of the servant. There's a few things about him that I think is worth underscoring and just will will play into you and I thinking out how you and I can indeed be those who serve our generation by the will of God and who become vessels fit for the master's use. Number one, he was a restored man. This is encouraging, a restored man. You don't have to have a perfect record for to be a servant that God can use. God could have discarded Jonah. He doesn't. God could have started afresh with someone else, but He didn't. The Word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time, verse 1, and arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. And so Jonah arose and went. He's a different man now. He's restored. He's been broken. He's been brought to a place of submission in chapter 2 with all that went on with the episode uh, 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 of the fish. God takes returns on damaged goods. God restores our souls, and then He leads us in the paths of righteousness. Psalm 23, verse 3. That's good to know, isn't it? Or what about the words of our Lord Jesus in Matthew 12, 20? A, 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 a bruised reed I will not break, and a smoking flax I will not quench. The image there, the, the reed was often cut down and then used as a little instrument, almost like a flute. But it was pretty fragile, and if it was bruised, it, it often produced a dull sound and was discarded, and another reed would be cut and turned into a, a little musical instrument. And Jesus is saying, hey, you know what? Bruised reeds are t- t- thrown away, but a, a, a bruised reed I will not discard. Smoking flax is a, you know, a, 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 um, a wick that's kind of damp and, 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 and just smoking rather than, than producing a flame. And often people just kind of wet their fingers and quench the thing, put it out, and now God will take that and fan it into a flame. And that's the message Jesus is saying, I can use any one of you. I won't discard you. You may be bruised and broken. may not be all that you could be, but I'll turn you into something more than you are if you'll submit. God can use the defeated to bring victory. God can use the weak to display His strength. God can use someone with a dark past to create a bright future. God can use the broken to bring healing to others. That's, that's, a, that's a good thing. I'm glad that, that God doesn't dis- discard us that way. Doesn't Zechariah 1 verse 3 encourage us where we read, return to me and I will return to you? So, and Jonah does that and God uses him despite his petulance and his reluctance and his disobedience. Some time ago, I was listening to um, Dr. David Jeremiah, and he said, something rather memorable. He said, God can hit straight licks with crooked sticks. We don't have to be among the beautiful people. We don't have to rank among the powerful. We don't even have to be great before God for God to do something great through us. We just have to be available, obedient, submissive. Jonah's a restored man. Secondly, Jonah's a reliant man. He's been humbled. Uh, he's, he's kind of had the, the rebellion and squeezed out of him because now he will arise in verse 3 according to the word of the Lord. He's not fleeing from the presence of God anymore. He's restored, and now he's reliant. In fact, you'll see at the end of chapter 2, but I will sacrifice to you, verse 9, with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Lord, get me out of here. And God commands the fish to vomit him out. 
He's now on dry land, and now he begins to indeed follow God's commands, restored and reliant. He's no longer leaning on his own understanding. He's now trusting the Lord with all his heart, and, 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 and now he's walking along the right paths. And, and you know what? That's going to have to be the key. He's going to have to be a man who's now exercising believing obedience and exercising faith in God because the mission requires it. The size of the city requires it. The nature of the Assyrians require it. The message given to him to give to them, one of judgment, requires it. He's going to have to trust God because this whole thing is improbable and this whole thing is impossible. But he's already seen the improbable. He's already seen the impossible. He spent three days and three nights in the belly of a fish and survived. He cried out to God, chapter 2 and verse 1. He prayed to the Lord from the belly of the fish. I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me out of the belly of death. I cried, you heard my voice. And he goes on to describe what God did in him while he was in the fish. Now he's out of the fish, re re restored and reliant. And his faith that he's going to have to exercise given the size of the city, the nature of the Assyrians, the message to be given, and the improbable nature of the task. Well, he's got faith. And it's faith born of answered prayer. It's Faith born of answered prayer. He cried out to the Lord in his affliction, and the Lord answered him. His soul was faint, and he remembered the Lord, and his prayer went up to God, and God did not forsake him. Jonah exercised a faith born of answered prayer. And you know what? You and I, within this chalked circle this morning where we desire to be available to God. We, we must allow God to restore our souls, and we, we must renew our faith in Him. And one of the ways we can do that is to look over our lives and, and check off those times where God answered prayer, showed Himself faithful. In fact, nobody, nobody in a sense, experienced that better than Hudson Taylor. You know something of the story, this, this man who left England to go to China to, to break fresh ground, to turn over hard soil and put the gospel there, then there might be a harvest of souls. That, that was nothing easy about that. How was he able to exercise such faith in China? Because he had learned to exercise such faith in England. And his faith was born of answered prayer. In fact, in his early days, he lived by faith, some ways in a very impractical way and in less than a prudent manner. In fact, he will admit later on that his motto is not necessarily biblical because at times he refused the normal means available to anybody to meet his need. At times he remained silent when he could have so easily spoke up. An example, when he worked for a particular company, his boss, on one particular occasion, forgot to give him his wages. Now, it would have been prudent, nothing unbiblical about going to the boss's office and saying, sir, you forgot to give me my wages. A man is worthy of his wages. Could I please have them? But he didn't. He just decided, I'm going to pray about that. God will take care of that. That was rather imprudent and impractical. But for him, it was a faith-building exercise. And before long, the boss remembers and Hudson Taylor said nothing, but he remembers and gives him his wages. And this went on time and time again in his life. And so when he sets off to England, from England to China, with very little backing and with the, the, the doubts of so many as a backdrop, a minister asks him how he expects to live in such a distant place with so little funding. Here's what Taylor says. It seems to be probable that I should need to do as the twelve and the seventy did in the Gospels, go without purse or script, relying on Him who sent me to supply all my need. And he does that in a marvelous way. Finds China Inland Mission, sets in motion a work in Asia that we are still seeing the spiritual reverberations of today. In fact, his son Howard Taylor said this, <clears throat> 
about his father. For 40 years, the sun never rose in China without it meeting my father on his knees in prayer to God. His faith was born of answered prayer. So was Jonah's. Jonah's not only a restored man, he's a reliant man. Thirdly, he's a reborn man. I think this is important. In a very real sense, the man that walks through the gates into the city of Nineveh is a man back from the dead. Now, he didn't die physically. I don't believe he died when he was in the belly of the fish. Some people argue that he did in keeping with Jesus' thought that as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth. I don't think Jonah has to die to fulfill that. I don't think he died physically, but he certainly died in terms of his rebellion, in terms of his obstinacy, in terms of his setting the agenda. That's what died. Look what he says in verse 2 of chapter 2, out of the belly of Sheol, that's the Hebrew term for the, the domain of death. If you scroll down to verse 6, you brought up my life from the pit. I mean, this was a man who stirred death in the face. This was a man who was brought to the edge of extinction. In the belly of the fish, his self-will died. In the belly of the fish, his self-ambition was killed. And when he's spit out by the fish, he's like a man emerging from the grave, reborn, back from the dead, a different man, a new man a man who's willing to go to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Remember what we're doing here? We're trying to remind ourselves while we cannot create a revival or an awakening any more than we can control the wind, we can set our sails for that wind. And we can wait in expectancy that God might blow in reviving, saving power in a miraculous manner. He has and He still might. But we need to set our sail for it. And the kind of man or woman that becomes a catalyst for a work of God is a man or woman reveling in the restoring grace of God, is a man or woman reliant on God, born of answered prayer, is a man or woman who has died to themselves. Isn't, didn't Jesus kind of touch on this as a principle for ministry, kind of death-producing life? What did He say in John 12, 24? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears fruit. And he's talking about his own death. I'm going to die. But in my dying comes life. And you'll see the apostles take that up. And, and realize when God does a work, small or great, He does it through a man or a woman who have died to self, denied self, who are malleable, whom God can take up at any moment because they have said, Lord, whatever, wherever, however. Remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8? We are always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Christ so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. My losses are your gain. My dying is your living. We've quoted it before, but it's so apropos to do it here before we move on. George Mueller, another great story like that of Hudson Taylor. God uses him in England as a pastor and a philanthropist. He, he manages orphanages. He trusts God like Taylor does to meet his needs. God does in marvelous ways. When they're out of milk, milk carriages break down in front of the orphanage, and rather than the milk spoil, it's given to the orphanage. You can read his story. You, you want to be used like that? Do I want to be used like that? Well, he, here's part of the secret. Here's what Mueller says. There was a day when I died. <laughs> 
utterly died, died to George Mueller, his opinions, preferences, tastes, will, died to the world, its approval or censorship, died to its approval or blame of even my brethren. And since then, I've studied only to show myself approved of God. So that's the man. What about the method? Let's make a start for the few minutes that are left. We'll pick this up next Sunday morning. The Great Awakening begins with a man restored and reliant and reborn whose only will is to do God's will. And so Jonah arises and goes to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Verse 4, and Jonah begins to enter the city at the first day and cries out. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. See, God had told him in verse 1, 2, go and preach the message that I tell you to preach. See, his proclamation of the word and of the impending judgment and the need for repentance is that which leads to this proclamation to fast among the citizens uh, of Nineveh. One proclamation leads to another proclamation. The method is preaching. The method is preaching. When it comes to great awakenings, the method is always the, the confident, clear communication of God's Word by a man who's reborn and who's broken and who's submissive and who revels in the restoring grace of God. This monumental and unparalleled move of God is brought about by one man burdened with one message and committed to one method. In fact, it's only five words in the Hebrew text, eight in our English Bible. Yet 40 days in Nineveh will be overthrown. I mean, that's just astounding. I want to take a step back because it cuts across the grain of what I'm reading and what I'm hearing. You know what? America is, is moving in the wrong direction. Of that, there's no doubt. The trends are not healthy, and they're certainly not holy. But by any measure, we're, 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 we're going in the wrong direction. The influence of the church is shrinking. Neo-paganism is, is grabbing hold of our country. Idolatry and immorality is the order of the day. We slaughter our children. We flaunt our sexual freedom. We mock our forefathers. We censor the Word of God. We persecute those who preach it. That's modern America, so what's the solution? Because it's beginning to look more and more like ancient Nineveh. Our cities are as wicked as Nineveh. Violence, abuse, theft, lawlessness. Our churches are empty. Our pubs are full. Well, what's the answer? Well, here's what we're told in increasing ways. It's, it's not going to work just to preach at them. Uh, the, 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 it, we've got to be dialogical. We've got to sit down and strike up a conversation. We've got to kind of, you know what, hear their story, uh, identify with them, be careful what we say and how we say it, you know. Be, be a bit more patient and work your way around to maybe a gospel opportunity. Can I ask you, as we look at the great awakening of the city of Nineveh, 600,000 people saved. Nia, uh, Jonah goes to a city with no Christian history. There are no synagogues in Nineveh. They were biblically illiterate. They, they had no appetite for this message. In fact, the message was a message of judgment. It wasn't very positive. And it just seems to me that you need to, we need to underscore it's God's method. That history shows us that, that burning hearts ablaze with God's glory are usually the result of flaming tongues. Men who preach the Word clearly and convincingly 
you know, study the Bible and you'll see the awakening under King Josiah comes because the book of the law is discovered and declared. Go to the time of Nehemiah and Ezra and the awakening that takes there. And in chapter 8, we read what? Bring the book. And they begin to explain it to the people. And the people begin to weep. What about the awakening under John the Baptist and Jesus and his apostles? John was a voice crying in the wilderness. Jesus came preaching. And his apostles went all to the world to teach the nations what he had commanded. Awakening under Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation was a word-driven movement. In fact, we quoted it, didn't we, where Luther said the Word of God did it all. What about the awakening in colonial America it came under the thunderous preaching of George Whitfield, the English evangelist. Guys, the method's preaching. Five Hebrew words. Now, I'm sure there was more, but the text tells us five Hebrew words, and this city is shaken. Because the power is in the word, it's living and it's powerful, it's the means of regeneration. The entrance of it brings light. It opens the eyes. It rejoices the heart. It saves the soul. Listen to Spurgeon. I would rather speak five words out of this book than 50,000 words of philosophers. If we, would want, if we want revivals, we must revive our reverence for the Word. If we want conversions, we must put more of God's Word into our sermons. I love that phrase. If we want revivals, we need to revive our reverence of the Word. I'll tell you another thing. We need to regain our belief that it is the power of God unto salvation. That it's not our argument. It's not our cleverness. It's not our techniques. It's the Word of God clearly, convincingly and compassionately shared. Now, there are several things about his preaching. Let me touch them too quickly. I'll revisit them next week and add a few others. Because if you look at his preaching, it's emphatic, expositional, experiential, and exclusive. Let me touch on the first two. Emphatic. Jonah wasn't embarrassed in his preaching. He didn't speak in hushed tones. He didn't communicate as a rather reserved man. He certainly didn't sit on a stool and strike up a conversation. No, the picture of him is as a lone figure, one man with one message, committed to one method. He goes into the city and he cries out. There's, a, there's emotion and pathos in that little phrase, isn't there? He cried out. He didn't whisper and he didn't whimper. And in fact, if you go up to the text where he's told by God to preach the message given to him, that's a word that carries the idea of a summons, an, an announcement by someone with authority, perhaps sent by a king or a rich man. So Jonah, go on behalf of the king of kings and tell the king of Nineveh and all the citizenry of that city, it's time to bow the knee because in 40 days I'm going to overthrow the city. You've got to love that. And as I read church history punctuated by special refreshing times from the presence of the Lord when God brings about a spiritual awakening, they are always accompanied by emphatic preaching. We saw it in, under King Josiah, under Nehemiah, under John the Baptist, under Jesus, the apostles, under Martin Luther, John Calvin, Zwingli, under the evangelical movement of the 18th century, men like Spurgeon and J.C. Ryle. We saw it under jo Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. And we're even seeing it today. The ministries that are having lasting impact or men like John MacArthur, John Piper, Alistair Begg, men committed to emphatic preaching. We, we need men called of God, men convinced of the power of the Word and who care little for the opinions of others. We, we need men who sense a call like Jeremiah to not be frightened of men's faces and to go and declare God's Word to the nations without fear. Listen to what uh, um, Al Mohler says in quoting Martin Luther. 
or Martin Lloyd-Jones, sorry, any study of church history, and particularly any study of the great periods of revival or reawakening, demonstrate above everything else just this one fact, that the Christian church during all such periods has spoken with authority. The great characteristic of all revivals has been the authority of the preacher. There seems to be something new, extra, irresistible in what is being declared on God's behalf. I mean, if I'm encouraged in any way, there are glimmers that there is a generation of young men stepping up and coming out of our seminaries who are committed to evangelical, emphatic preaching, who, who have grown up in the church growth movement, who, 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 have, who have put their store in, in, in techniques and persuasion and methods and the cleverness of man and marketing and realized it's a failure. The only thing that wakens a dead society is the thunderous voice of God through His Word and by His servants. Was it Theodore Beza who said of John Calvin, every word weighed a pound? Love that. Secondly, and finally this morning, expository. Not only emphatic, but expository. Notice verse 2. Preach to it the message that I tell you. He was to tell them what God told him. He was to proclaim the message given. He was not to edit it. He was not to embellish it. He was not to soften it. Word for word, he was to tell them what God told him. Now, God is speaking directly to his servant. This is unique. This is a prophet. And I believe those days are gone. The apostles and prophets are in the foundation. God's Word has been written. God spoke through prophets. God has spoken through His Son. And God, indeed, has spoken through His apostles. We now have the complete canon. So we do have the words of God through those to whom God spoke directly. They weren't allowed to embellish it, edit it, or soften it, and neither are we. Woe to any man that adds to it or subtracts to it. And so we must never as we preach it, attempt to make the message more attractive by adding to it. We should never make the mistake of trying to make it more compelling by subtracting from it. And the importance of that statement is to be seen in that it would be easy for Jonah to want to edit it, embellish it, or soften it. Because the message isn't a very positive one. Forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. It wasn't a feel-good message. It didn't appeal to their human nature. It was foreign to them as Ninevites, and it necessitated a singular response, repent, turn or burn. The preacher has no liberty to invent his own sermon. He has no liberty to censor the voice of the master when, he is ex when it is expressed in the text. That's why I believe in expository preaching. Because in expository preaching, I'm committed to exposing the text. I, I don't read the text and then go off and do my own thing. I don't springboard off a verse and preach to you what I think is on my heart. And it's my job to come humbly in service to the text and let the Bible speak. Because God has spoken, it's my job to speak what God speaks. God is not silent, He's spoken. And my words can only be justified in his words. And that's what expositors do. Jonah went to Nineveh according to the word of God, and he spoke the word of God. John 3.34 tells us that anyone sent from God speaks his words. And that's what we need today. That's what setting the seal is all about. It's... it's it's waiting on God. It's being faithful to God. It's allowing His Word to speak because there is the power. And through that power, there are mercy drops around us that are falling, and maybe we can plead for showers. As the team comes up, I, 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 I don't like to pick on this man, but I, I think it's a good example of what we're talking about here, the danger of editing or embellishing or softening the message. Uh, the unwillingness of the church today in, 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 uh, in this culture that's not unlike Nineveh, 
to not speak emphatically and expositorily. You, 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 have you been following the controversy regarding Carl Lentz, pastor of Hillsong Church in New York? You know, a while ago, I think it was in October, he appeared on The View. It's not a very gospel-friendly environment, I can tell you that. <laughs> and when he was asked by Joy Behar if abortion was considered a sin in his church. Here's what he said in reply. That's the kind of conversation we would have finding out your story, where you're from, what you believe. I mean, God's the judge. And at this point, the audience claps rapturously. Never a good sign if you're a gospel minister. <laughs> and he goes on to say this, people have to live by their own convictions. That's such a broad question to me. I'm going high. I want to sit with somebody and say, what do you believe? I'm like, what do you believe? That's, I haven't heard a thing yet about what you believe. In fact, this is picked up by Behar, and she follows up. So it's not an open and shut case to you, speaking of, is abortion a sin? She's admitting in this follow-up question, you're dancing, dodging, du diving, and ducking. So, so you know what? Is this, is this kind of not an open and shut case with you? Here's what he says. Some people would say it is. Wow. To me, I'm trying to teach people who Jesus is first and find out their story before I start picking and choosing what I think is sin in your life. I'd like to know your name. Oh, come on. I, I get it. I understand. You know, there, there's, there's a place to be as gentle as doves and as wise as serpents. And there's a place to be compassionate and realize that in some cases, women have acted in desperation. But come on, it's a simple question. Is abortion a sin? Of course it is. Amen. It's murder. And our culture is like the culture of Moloch, where we're sacrificing our children on the altar of convenience and personal freedom. And here's a gospel minister supposed with a microphone and a national audience. Of course be wise. Of course be gracious. But say something. Be emphatic. Speak the Word of God. Let God defend His glory. Let the Spirit of God work. When we want to see a great awakening. We need to awake. We need to become men and women committed to one method. We need to be not ashamed of the gospel, Amen. for it's the power of God unto salvation. Uh, hey, it's not easy. You know, it's, what, what are you going to do when they stick a microphone under your nose or your camera in, right in your face? Well, my friend, that'll be sorted out within that chalked circle when you and I just dedicate ourselves afresh that whatever happens, whatever the challenge, we're going to be faithful to the message. We're going to be faithful to the gospel. We're going to tell the culture what God tells us to tell the culture and leave the results to God. Let's pray. Lord, we uh, thank you for our time back in Jonah. As we have followed him, we can see ourselves at times running from the hard sayings of your word, from challenging contacts for ministry. We're not unwilling at times to pay the price. We, we, we seek our comfort. We, we don't love our enemies enough. We've followed him there, and we can see ourselves in that. And yet we thank you you didn't abandon him, although he sought to abandon you. You tracked him down. You broke him. You brought him to a place where he was restored, made to be reliant, he emerges as a man back from the dead to become a catalyst for gospel change. Oh, God, do that in each of our lives. And Lord, help us to believe that indeed you can at times awake in marvelous and momentous ways 
We thank you for the mercy drops that fall. But for the showers we plead. Help us indeed to put ourselves in the way of your blessing. Help us to hoist the seal to catch that sovereign work of the Holy Spirit as the wind blows in saving power. Lord, in our preaching and our evangelism, make us emphatic and make us faithful to the word. Help us not to be ashamed. Help us to believe it's the power. It's our job to communicate the gospel, your job to save, and we'll leave the results to you, small or great. For we pray and ask these things in Jesus' name.